praise, praise the Lord. It's my honor to be here tonight again. I honor the grace of God upon this commission and upon his servant, Reverend Emmanuel Owusu. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. It's such an honor, and I don't take it for granted. The Lord bless you richly. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for your labor of love. The Lord increase you, strengthen you, and embrace you for His generation. I'm just seeing my brother and friend. Apostle Benjamin Button. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. This is a tight period for him. I wasn't expecting to see you. I thought we'd see you sometime in the day, but it's so good to have you here. I want to salute every minister of God in the house tonight and everybody. Everybody that have made up time to come, the Lord bless you richly. I know your lives will never remain the same again. And tonight again, we will try to establish precepts, even as we build up in the course of this conference. God's servant was telling me that um, we will meet tomorrow, so we will still have some buffer to build on the word of the Lord briefly before we release the fire of the Holy Ghost. You know, Ghana is a nation of gifted men and gifted women. And so it's always important for us to take our time to look into scriptures and to understand what God does amongst us and why he does what he does. Because if we don't know that, we may abuse spiritual things. And that's why the emphasis on the word is prime in this season. And I believe the Lord will help us even as we journey in scriptures tonight by his grace. Are you ready to receive? Yeah. Lift your hands toward heaven and talk to the Lord. When we, when we walk with the Lord In the light of His Word What a glory He sheds on our way When we do His good will He abides with us still
Thank you for the great and mighty things that you are doing in our midst. Thank you for the greater things that you will yet do. Lord, we know that everyone here tonight and everyone connected online will be blessed beyond measure. Let your words come into our spirits and become life. Let these words become instruments of direction. Let these words become life for empowerment. Giving us capacity and grace to do that which we must do to stay relevant in your economy. Take all the praise, take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God in solitude, they left everything. So the songs they sing are actually echoes of eternity. So they are always fresh. I read the story of a blind woman, Fanny Crosby, that sang 8,000 hymns. Every day you sing them, the heavens open. A new generation of psalmists will rise. That will not sing songs because they have good voices. They will sing songs because their songs will become a string of the heart of the Father. Songs that have the power to transport us to dimensions of glory. To be happy in Jesus. It doesn't even matter if you have a good voice or not. The hymn itself can argument for a bad voice and still produce an atmosphere of glory. You know, I was sharing with my brother, Pastor Kusi, earlier, and I told him there's a difference between a gift and an entrustment. A gift can be developed by spiritual principles, by yielding to the laws that regulate that gift. But you see, a man can grow in a gift and have no relationship with God. If a gift begins to work in your life, you may realize that through meditation, your prophetic grace can become sharper. But you are just developing a gift. But when a man has an entrustment from God, it does not necessarily function by applying yourself to the laws of that gift. An entrustment is the credibility of God invested on a man because that man is counted faithful. You can function by gift by developing your faith, but an entrustment is not a function of faith, it's a function of faithfulness. Faith is your ability to trust God. Faithfulness is when God trusts you. They are two different things. When a man who has a prophetic gift is ministry, you'll be wowed at the dexterity of his flow in the spirit. But when a man who has the credibility of God is ministry, the fear of the Lord will hit the territory. He may not be talking about repentance, but people will repent because he addresses territorial spirits. He doesn't just minister to men, he ministers to spirits. Those are the kind of men that can create change in the land. And this is why we are studying the subject we are studying, that beyond giftings, we will come to places where God can trust us with powers. The powers of the ages to come. The kind of power that men like Moses wielded. You don't know the gift of the spirit is operating in, but with his staff, he brought down Egypt. 
to be happy in Jesus. To trust no when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, for the glory He sheds on our way. When we do His good will, He abides with us. You know, I think some days we'll have a meeting and we'll just sing hymns. They purify, they purify. We'll just sing hymns and worship God. You will cry, you will have encounters, you will just go refreshed. Hallelujah. Please sit down for a moment. I want to share God's word with us for just 40 minutes. And then we will pray for another five minutes and leave. Because we have tomorrow. I've decided to do the impartation service tomorrow. And then the healing service on Sunday. It's always a privilege to look into God's word again and again. So this is um, a conference where we are considering the subject of revival. The wind of revival. And so last night, we began to look at what necessitates revival. Tonight, we are going to look at the making of revivalists. And tomorrow, we'll look at the protocol of revival. The protocol of revival. Is prophetic <laughs> to be refreshed. <laughs> Hallelujah. So last night we looked at the necessity of revival. Tonight we'll look at the making of revivalists. Tomorrow we'll look at the protocol of revival and have an impartation service. And then on Sunday we'll have a healing service. Is that fine? So let me do a quick recap. I began to explain to us the need for revival. And I told us. Revival is not good news in the spirit. And the reason is because a revival is an indication in the realm of God that the body of Christ is beginning to fail in their mandate. So it's an intervention program of divinity to resuscitate the body of Christ and to give them the empowerment required to align with the movements and the vibrations of the spirit. God does not expect the body of Christ to backslide and having the need to be resuscitated. But unfortunately, that is where we find ourselves. So once and again, when the program of God is beginning to suffer depreciation because the people of God no longer have the stature to wield the scepter of the spirit, God will have to pour out the spirit afresh to make for their weaknesses and their insufficiencies and empower them with the requisite requirements of the spirit to do that which they must do in order to fulfill divine mandate. And I said, these things don't just happen. They are carefully orchestrated patterns from the spirit realm, the demonic realm actually. The body of Christ oftentimes are lured into a place of departure from God. And so the things they once had, they find it difficult to wield them. You wake up one day, you discover that you are flowing mightily in the things of the spirit. And then the point comes, you begin to take for granted the things that made it possible for you to walk in those dimensions. You know, once upon a time, you had hunger for God's presence. Once upon a time, fasting was your lifestyle. Once upon a time, you could sit on God's word for hours. And then you step out and you pray for the sick and the sick are healed. Suddenly, people begin to gather to listen to you. And then you now discover that the things that you were doing, which was a heritage of God committed to your hand, you begin to take those things for granted. And because the miracles are still taking place, you don't realize that you have lost the things that truly really matter. You now begin to function on the wind of what is happening. After a while, you will discover that the miracles may not stop, but the quality of the God life in your spirit will be reduced. And then even though miracles are taking place, you will discover that you can no longer sense God. The presence of God that came to you and was abundant, you will no longer sense it. You will walk in the gift, but you will not sense God anymore. 
and after a while you'll discover you begin to die from within if you are smart you will know that you need a revival these things happen to individuals and it also happens to the body of christ so yesterday we began to understand the things and the indicators that when we see we realize that there is a need for revival and we began from the book of judges i read the book of judges chapter 2 for us from verse 7 to verse 11 and the bible said after the death of joshua and the elders that walked with joshua he said there arose a generation that did not know the lord and i said not knowing the lord is not necessarily not knowing the name of jesus not knowing the lord means the ways of god is no longer the ways of his people so you find out an elderly generation that existed before that prayer for them was intimacy with the lord and then you find a new generation that prayer becomes a show even though all of them are praying the emphasis is different the intentions are different the motives are different you find a generation that once feared the lord and when they came to god's presence they saw themselves as servants then you find another generation that arises after the previous generation that things coming to the place of service is a show and then it's all about titles it's all about eloquence it's all about excellence it's all about honor so we emphasize honor we emphasize excellence at the expense many times at the expense of the move of the spirit so a pastor can shut down a whole service because the lighting is not in place and even though the holy ghost is moving he doesn't care he needs the lighting to be in place so that the streaming on youtube can be perfect that's the kind of generation we have found ourselves so when you come to that kind of generation then you know that this is a generation that don't know the lord now there is nothing wrong with excellence there is nothing wrong with order there is nothing wrong with honor but if it is at the expense of the move of god then god is no longer lord the things we pursue is now our lord so the bible spoke of a generation that did not know the lord in the days of joshua joshua was taught the ordinances of god by moses and joshua knew what it means to sit in god's presence for 40 days so even though activities are going on, Joshua will sit at the foot of the mountain because Moses said to sit there and he will be there for 40 days. But we have a generation that is in a rush. They think everything must be in a rush. So service has to be 5 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes because we have multiple services but there is no time to raise people and to give them stamina. When people come to church from January to December, it's about one program or the other that attend to their earthly needs not their eternal needs so while they are growing in their earthly needs they are dying as touching their eternal needs so you have people that are prospering in their offices prospering in their businesses which is very good but these same people are dying of addiction masturbation immorality and so many other things and you don't pay attention to eternal matters we pay attention to ethnic matters so when you see a crowd gather go close it's either a miracle service or it's a prosperity service or it's a seminar of some sort it has to do with earthly things and jesus said not to mind the things of this world he said that is the way of the pagans he said you seek after the kingdom and its righteousness and all these things shall be added to you but when you find the generation that don't know the lord our mingling with the world system so when you see that our emphasis are no longer eternal things and we begin to major on earthly things you will discover that we begin to mingle with our world system our world system becomes the source of our inspiration and that's why i told us yesterday even the songs we sing in church when you examine them critically you will discover that most of the beats we dance to in church were created by secular musicians and those are the same beats they dance to in clubhouses what does that tell you we can no longer pipe the frequencies of heaven we now depend on the world system to give us vibrations that excite us and the problem with vibration is that it has the power to alter your spiritual structure because spirits move on vibration so the moment we continue doing that a point will come where we will enter the third step the first step is a generation that no longer knows the lord the second step is mingling with the world system the bible says friendship with the world is enmity with god the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For they that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. He said, what is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. But when a generation does not know the Lord, inevitably, that generation will befriend the world system. 
so their dress code their utterances their lifestyle will be a reflection of what you see in society so you can no longer distinguish between the church and the society because the church and the society have become one we have entered into an ungodly marriage that cannot be substantiated by the ordinances of God now when that begins to happen the third protocol is activated the third protocol the Bible said the people forgot their God you will discover that you will forget the laws that govern your walk with God when you started walking with the Lord you would realize that going to the place of prayer will become difficult but once upon a time you could not miss your prayer time you will realize that giving to the things of the spirit becomes difficult why because you are beginning to forget your god so the things of god no longer holds power in your spirit the things that you desired the things that you trembled before no longer mean anything to you you could come to church church is not yet over you stand up carry your bag and move because you are tired because you no longer tremble at the presence of god what has happened you are beginning to forget your god you are beginning to forget the laws of your god you are beginning to forget the glory of your God. You are beginning to forget the presence of your God. So even when the presence of God is in a meeting, you don't know. Because now you have drifted to sensuality. So, so long as you are not feeling something, the presence of God is not there. But before now, when you heard the word of God, the word of God meant so much to you. You could pick the presence of God in the word of God. You could be walking on the street. Somebody quotes a scripture. You could pick the presence of God. You could walk close to a man. You could pick the presence of God. How come you are now in church? You can no longer pick the presence of God because you have become rusty. You have forgotten the presence. You have forgotten the glory. You have forgotten the laws. You have forgotten the ordinances. You have even forgotten the covenants that you have with God. There was a time when you had laws in relating with the opposite sex. There was a time when there was a law on how you related with God's money and the finances of the kingdom. There was a time when there was a law that governed your prayer. You didn't just wake up and cross your leg on the bed to pray. When you pray, you are sensitive about the presence of God. You had reverence for the presence of God. You were conscious of the glory of God. But right now, these things don't matter anymore. Why? Because you have forgotten the glory. You have forgotten the presence. You have forgotten the covenants. You have forgotten the law. Why did it happen? Because you befriended the world. So when we begin to have friendship with the world, it looks harmless, but over time, it will, it will germinate to another devil. And when it begins to grow, we begin to depart from the Lord. And the fourth thing the Bible revealed to us from Judges chapter 3 is that these people began to do evil in the sight of the Lord. They began to do evil in the sight of the Lord. First, they didn't know the, their Lord anymore. They began to befriend the world. After befriending the world, they, has, they, have, they began to make compromises. After making compromises, they began to depart from God and forgot their God. Now they can do evil before the Lord. A man before who wept because somebody fell, now he falls and his conscience does not even prick him anymore. Why? Because his conscience is now seared with a hot iron. His conscience has now been destroyed. So evil has become natural to him. He will lie to have his way. And it's not a big deal. Sometimes he even lies to get spiritual things to happen. And then he thinks he's serving the Lord. Because evil has been ingrained in his lifestyle. When we get to that point, then what is remaining is the fifth. We begin to worship strange gods. And I told you, strange gods are not necessarily the ones you see in the shrine. Strange gods could be money. The goal of the ministry is about money. Everything you do is to get money from people. From January to December, the message ends with giving. Because you want the money. The moment church is over, it's money you are looking at. You can choose to start service every day because every day people give offering. Money becomes the motivation. Money has become your goal. The goal can become fame and popularity. So you are not interested in whether people are transformed or not. Ministry have been there for 10 years. Nobody has given his life in that ministry and grown to maturity. But you don't care. So long as the crowd is coming, so long as things are happening and you are being popular, it doesn't matter because fame is the pursuit. How many people have you labored on and poured your life upon? You have been in ministry for five years. Jesus was in ministry for three and a half years. He raised 500 men. And these 500 men had so much stature that when one fell, and the one who fell, fell because he was the son of perdition, they could just stretch their hand and pick anybody. And the person they picked had the same stature as Peter. 
because he poured his life in the people but we have a ministry today where a pastor doesn't even have time to, to, to check the growth of the people it, it is not about the people it's always about fame we are beginning to worship, worship another God because there is a God of fame there is a God of money we worship a lot of gods and we are not aware because Jesus is no longer Lord and I told us yesterday that at salvation there were two confessions we made the first confession we made was the confession of the immortality of Jesus Christ you believe that he was raised from the dead that was what credited eternal life into your spirit the second confession we made was the Lordship of Jesus Christ the Lordship of Jesus Christ is different from the immortality of Jesus Christ the immortality of Jesus Christ gives you the life of God but the Lordship of Jesus Christ makes you a servant of God but a point comes when even though your salvation is not lost but Jesus is no longer your Lord you begin to worship strange gods and when we begin to worship strange God the jealousy of God will not allow God to continue relating with us at that point two things are possible either we realize it and repent for God to pour out his spirit upon us or God will leave us and another people will come to enslave us it is in that buffeting that we will remember that we have lost our relationship with God and we will turn back to the Lord but I told you the reason God raises revivalists is because God does not want his people to go into captivity and be reminded of him because of captivity so God raises men that begin to sound the trumpet in Zion so that they that are asleep in Zion will wake up that's why I said blow the trumpet in Zion sound an alarm upon his holy mountain because many are at ease in Zion and the Bible say woe unto him that is at ease in Zion this is why many times the Canaanites the Amorites the Amalekites will come and take God's people and make a slave of them because it is in their peri that they remember their God but we will not wait until we are slaughtered we will not wait until corruption become the order of the day that is why we are calling upon the name of our God that by all means there will be another outpouring that a generation will rise in the fear of the Lord and come under the government of his spirit Afghanistan you don't know what is happening around Pakistan you don't know what is happening around China around Japan if it is this thing we are preaching 10,000 people gather around you and you are teaching there about wealth creation that's what pastors are preaching wealth creation we even come to organize cryptocurrency conference in church <laughs> because our goal is how to succeed if the world were to rest on our gospel many continents would deny jesus because what we are preaching the church in afghanistan doesn't need it the church in china doesn't need it the church in pakistan doesn't need it we are preaching what we are preaching because persecution have not come and we have not realized that we are in the last days if you know you are in the last days you will teach people a gospel that will make them come to a point where dying for Jesus will be an honor if you have not taken your congregation there you have not begun to help them they will not know it wait until war come everybody can run from a city and then all of those your prosperity gospel they will run from all the assets and I'm not talking about against it but if that becomes our major emphasis then we are children 
And what we don't know is that there is an encroachment strategy that is going on. The enemy is coming. He's coming. And the time is short. The age of man is about to end. We don't have so much time on this side anymore. But men are not aware that there is a race of eternity. There is a race of eternal relevance that we are already losing out on because we are pursuing earthly things. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, all these things that the pagans seek will be added to you. But we are pursuing the addition because we are not aware of the times that we are in. Let me show you a scripture that Jesus himself spoke. Matthew chapter 24 from verse 9. Before I enter into what I'm entering, so you know the, the reason why we are not ready for the last days. Because what they are teaching us, we will not survive these days that Jesus spoke about. He said, they shall deliver you up to be, number one, afflicted. Did you hear any gospel in the body of Christ now that makes it look as if you need to build capacity for affliction? No. Because we don't know we are in the last day. There are five things you must survive in the last day. The first is what? Affliction. He said they will deliver you to be afflicted. This affliction is called persecution. And I told us yesterday the cross that Jesus said we should carry is not sin and sickness. It's persecution. The body of Christ will be persecuted. And so the church we are raising now is a warrior church. So that everybody, like in the days of the first apostles, you can pick a deacon from church and he will enter a city and conquer the whole city. And even if he has to die there, it's an honor. I read the story of the Moravian brothers. They were so passionate about God and they needed to enter the nation of France. But there was no way they would be giving allowance to France. So the only way they could enter France was to sell themselves as slaves. And when they sold themselves as slaves, they gave the money for charity. And they were carried to France as slaves. Because that was the only way they could smuggle the gospel to the nation of France. But you go to church every day and all you are taught is how to succeed. How can you stake your neck for the kingdom? That's why we remain infantile. What Jesus said is, you will be delivered to be afflicted. Those are witnesses. It's not everybody. There are some that will run for their life. But there are many that will say, I will stand here to the end. If God sent me to, to Ghana, I will be here even if everybody leaves Ghana. I heard Bishop Oedeko said something. He said, if everybody is running from Nigeria, I will be the last. I will stand here till I die. Because we don't pursue things. We pursue the kingdom. We pursue Christ and his government. You will be delivered to be afflicted. Number two, he said, you shall be killed. That's the second thing we endure in the last day. This is why the gospel of the last day is the cross of Jesus Christ. And the cross is not a wound. The cross is a testimony of total surrender. The cross is a testimony of total submission to the government of Jesus Christ. Even when it is at the expense of everything you stand for, including your life. He said you will be delivered to be killed. Unless you don't want to be a witness. If you just want to be an ordinary Christian, that's good. Continue with what you are doing. But if you want to be a witness that God can trust and commit kingdom to you, you must pass these five criteria. He said, you will be delivered to be killed. And he went further. He said, you shall be hated by many nations for my sake. And then he went to number three. He said, many shall be offended because there shall be betrayer of one another. So the third thing you will endure is betrayer. The people you labor with over time, they will be the one to send you off. You will discover that you can't find men of integrity anymore because their bellies have become their gods. So the man that you thought you invested and labored with, a day will come, he will look at you, he will sell you for 30 pieces of silver. They say you will be betrayed. But one thing you must learn how to endure and survive is offense. Refuse offense from entering your heart because these are requirements of the last day. So first of all, you must survive affliction. You must survive death. You must survive offense and betrayal. And then he went to number four. He said there will be iniquity. He said because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. This is why today immorality is a natural part of us. So now they have what they, they have different kinds of counseling sessions where pastors try to manage things. Because what is happening in church, if he says it, the church can't continue. Instead of us ministers to now be troubled and teach the people the way of righteousness and to teach them the terror of God. We come to church every day, we are interested in money. 
So we want to take money from them. And so long as the person can bring money, it doesn't matter if it's a thief. It doesn't matter if it's a fornicator. The goal is to take the money. And when we take the money, we don't care about their soul. But what we don't know is that God will ask us that question. How can you be pastoring 10,000 people and the city doesn't feel your impact? And every time you come, you are happy. You are snapping overflow that 10,000 people came to church. You are talking to 10,000 people and the territory is still in darkness. It means you are failing in your office. Because Jesus spoke to 500 people and the Bible said, This be the man that turned their walls upside down. How come you are talking to 10,000 people and that city have not felt the impact of revival? Because what you are feeding them with is milk. You have not given them strong meat. If you talk to 10,000 people and you tell them the right thing, that city will be on fire for Jesus Christ because everyone will become a witness and the nation will be turned upside down for God. But we have a generation where people brag in the fact that church is large but they are not moved when the territory is in darkness. God forbid that you have the influence over 10,000 people and the territory is in darkness. God will ask you what you have been telling them because if you tell them the gospel of the kingdom, they will change that territory. The love of many will wax cold because iniquity will abound. But you see, most of us, we are already cold. I told you yesterday, that's why the temperature of our individual prayer is weak. Now, when we come to pray, we need to play chant at the background to pray. Warriors, we need a chant to pray. What if God sends you to a wilderness? What will you do? You don't know that in your spirit is a song of songs. There is a chant that is in your spirit because you are connected to the river of eternity. You are waiting for because iniquity will abound the love of many shall wax cold and jesus went further and said but they that endure to the end so the last battle is the battle of endurance the greatest warfare in the spirit is the battle of attrition the battle of attrition is not the devil doesn't come to win you he comes to weary you out so he's not hitting you to go down he hits on you on one spot until you give up the goal is to weaken your conviction so that when you are weak no matter what happens you can be restored it's called the battle of attrition is to weary you out but jesus said we must fight that battle and endure to the end so there are five things that every believer in the last day must survive the first is affliction the second is death. The third is offense and betrayal. The fourth is iniquity. And the fifth is attrition. That the warfare of the devil can wear you out. And the only way you can get to that point where you have that level of stamina is when your pursuit of God is not for the things that he gives. Your pursuit of God becomes God himself. Everything God gives you makes you a trust fund. If money comes to your hand, you are a trust. If property comes to your hand, you are a trust. What it means is that you are God's bank on the earth. So when God wants to reach people, he saves money with you. You cannot bank on that thing. Because that thing just makes you a channel for God. So when God wants to reach the poor, he says, where is that 2,000 kana CD I gave you? Take it to the orphanage. Yes, Lord. If you are like that, you won't come to God for money. Because you know any money God gives you is not for yourself. You are just a trust. Hope you know that the money in UNICEF does not belong to UNICEF. UNICEF is a trust. So when they want to come to Africa, they go and fetch from that account. How can you now be serving God for money when all the money God gives you is a trust? There's a portion of it we enjoy, but your goal is not enjoyment. They say, give, tell them that are rich in this world not to be high-minded, not trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in the living God that giveth to every man liberally that he may enjoy. I'm not preaching to you the gospel of suffering, but I'm telling you that there is a state of conviction that we attain that we know our pursuit of God is not for the things God gives, it's for God himself. And if we come to the point where we have to give up everything, we will do it gladly. I heard the story of the patriarchs of old that brought the gospel of Christ to Africa. Most of them were buried on these mountains, you see. But they never stopped coming. They killed them, the more they came. They killed them, they came. The Bible you are reading today, many persons were burnt on the stake for the copy of the Bible to make it to another day. Because sometimes in a, in a city, only one man will have the copy of the Bible and his goal is to run with it until he hands it over to another witness and when he hands it over most times they catch them and ask them where is that Bible they will never speak and they will burn them alive but they will not cry their joy is that the Bible have made it to another person's hand and today you hold that Bible 
you don't know that that pipe will come to you swimming in the river of the blood of Matthias. And we come to church, we don't know that church is an equipping ground. We don't know that church is a ground where we wear our spiritual armory. We think church is just a place where we come for social gathering. We are not taught because we don't know that it's a warrior church God is raising. If it is these Christians today that were the first Christians, Christianity would have finished from this world. Because the believers I see today, they will not die because of the Bible. They will say, okay, don't worry, let the Bible be burnt. At least, let me keep my family. Because they don't understand divine posterity. They don't understand the reward system of eternity. I read about men that some of them were tied and they watched their family killed just for them to either change their confession or to reveal where the Bible is so that they will destroy it. But they kept quiet. They killed their wives, killed their children. That's why you and I could call the name of Jesus today. Do you think the next generation have hope if this is the kind of Christianity we do? Because we don't know what God is doing. Of a man called John Hoss. He was fighting to preserve the testimony of Jesus Christ when idolatry was about to take over the church through Catholic Catholicism. They caught him and his son, tied them to a stake when they were about to burn them. They looked at his son. He was a Bohemian priest, and he looked at his son. He said, "Today we will set this city on fire." That's a man about to be born with his son. He said, we will set this city on fire. And he looked at the people who wanted to kill him. He said, today, you want to kill a goose. Because his name is Hoos, which means a goose. He said, 100 years later, you will see a swarm of geese. 100 years later, that was when Martin Luther rose up. Because of the prophecy of a man who was about to die. And he wrote the 97 treaties against the government of Rome. Because the man knew that death was not cessation of life he knew that men like him don't die they transit to glory for them what you call death is a departure from one level of glory to another but what is the gospel that they had what did they know about God that our generation don't know that's why we must seek the face of God for virgin dimension and to find out the witness that we need in order to defend the integrity of God in our generation. What if Christianity depended on you? What if you are the hope of God for this generation? This kind of Christianity you are practicing, will there be hope for another generation? What if you were the poor of this generation? You don't even have enough stamina to study the word of God. You carry the Bible for 10 minutes, you say, no, I have to go to work. And every day you walk for eight hours but you can't sit on the bible for one hour what if god wanted you to communicate his oracles to the next generation that means there'll be no hope for christianity
is a lexicon in the spirit that is not for crowds it is for men that were bold enough to cross the threshold there is a place in the spirit that cannot be erased the names of men are written there as immortal witnesses he said Paul and Barnabas this be the man that has started their lives for the gospel there's a place where you call the company of apostles but there is another place where you have to separate apostles according to the texture of their witness that one is not for apostles it's for Paul and Barnabas that's why he said I have finished my course I have kept the faith I have fought a good warfare there remained for me he didn't say for the body there remained for me a crown of life because Paul and Barnabas they were men that asserted their life don't quote every scripture because some scripture are inheritances for men that cross certain thresholds in the spirit I politicians compromise because when they came to church we didn't teach them that they were witnesses we didn't tell them that they were apostles in the political corridor when they came to church we were looking for favor from them you are not asked to seek favor with the politician you should teach him the truth and the oracles of God so when he goes there he can contend with the beast that sits in politics but unfortunately when they came to church we were interested in their pockets we were not interested in telling them the oracles of God Come 
Nada.
there is a fire that will come from the presence of God that will come upon you now and you will be changed into another man in the name of Jesus the risen Christ I release that impartation from the left to the right from the front to the back Holy Ghost touch touch in the spirit the waters of the spirit are being stirred thank you father I have owned the republic of Zusa time in Jesus name In Jesus' name. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
If you can, please be seated. If you can, be seated. Thank you, Father. The spirit of intercession is falling on someone now. The power and the stamina on the altar. Ushers, please find that person quickly. In the name of Jesus, I release that impartation. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Please be seated. Descends and deteriorates to the level of worshipping strange gods. Then the next protocol that he activates is the betting of revivalists. Men that they will send to blow the trumpet in Zion and to sound the alarm upon the holy mountains of God. In the next 15 minutes, I want to share with us the making of revivalists. There are three things that happens to a man that God wants to raise as a revivalist. Revivalists are not trained in a Bible school. They may go to a Bible school to learn theology and doctrine, which is very important. But the spirit of revival is not a token from a Bible school. There is a rigid divine protocol that is instituted for everyone that will herald the move of God in a generation. As I share it, some of you will realize that it's begun to happen with you already. The first thing that happens to a revivalist is that God begins to bring him visitations and encounters. A man that has the power to cause a stirring in his generation must have encounters that ranked that level of power in the spirit. Men are not the same in the spirit. We speak from different mountains. Horan is the mountain where a deliverer is raised. Sina is the mountain where the commandments of God are given. There are different mountains in the spirit. And every mountain is representative of a kind of encounter. And so when God wants to raise a revivalist, he begins to introduce him to the realms of encounters. The quality of encounters you have is what determines the texture of your witness to a generation. But encounters are not free gifts of God. Encounters and the mountains of encounters are places in the spirit that men travel to. It took Elijah 40 days to journey to Horeb. You must travel to the mountain of encounter. And so when God wants to bring you encounters, 
there are certain tokens of the spirit that are activated in your life one of them is a hunger there is an un unquenchable hunger for the presence of God when that hunger comes knows that you are beginning to travel another is a body sometimes you wake up and you discover you suddenly have a body to bring an end to corruption in Ghana to bring an end to immorality to bring an end to false prophets and that body becomes the reason why you press into God it's a journey to the mountain of encounter the prayers and the intercessions themselves are not what produces the power of revival but those prayers they are vehicles of transport in the spirit that takes you to the mountain of encounter so in Exodus chapter 3 we heard concerning Moses who was one of the foremost revivalists in scripture he said Moses kept the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro until he came to the backside of the wilderness even unto Horeb and there he saw a bush burning that was not consumed without an encounter there will be no power to bring emancipation to the body of Christ and to a generation in Judges chapter 6 we saw that Israel had reduced to a place of peasants in captivity they were so afraid of their enemies that they had to hide in caves to survive and the Bible said when they finished gathering their harvest the Midianites came upon them and took all from them and they did not even have enough strength to fight until the Bible said God visited Gideon without encounter you have no power to change your world every revivalist and every man you see creating a change in his world is coming from a mountain of encounter he said then the word of the Lord was cast first Samuel chapter 3 verse 1 and he said the lamp in the temple had gone dim. and in verse 21 he said the Lord appeared again to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord you must have encounter with the Lord or with his word or with his spirit or with beings of heaven they are the ones that brings you the requirement of power Israel was in captivity for 400 years there was no prophetic voice from Malachi to Matthew until suddenly the Bible said a man had an encounter with God and in John 1 33 he said the one that sent me I'm not going because I read the Torah I met someone in the wilderness the one that sent me the same said unto me he said whomever you see the spirit descending and remaining on him the same will baptize with the Holy Ghost and power so the power to spare the generation comes from the mountain of encounter that's why every revivalist knows the way of solitude you must serve his hunger you must serve his body until it brings you to your mountain of encounter when you see people who think revival is about a message they are joking you can preach the same message that George Whitefield preached people will leave that meeting and go to a beer party you can preach the same message that John Wesley preached it will change nothing it depends on the height where you are speaking from and so you must journey on the mountain of encounter until you get to places where you are taught the ways of heaven and the laws of the world to come John said I John I was in the eye called Patmos and I heard the sound that of a trumpet in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 he said the same voice that spoke to me like a trumpet he said unto me come and I will show you the things hereafter he was talking about the civilization of heaven the ways of the world is a way of corruption there's no way you can be taught by the world system so you have to come back to the school of the spirit and you must be taught the way of God from the heights of heaven I will show you the things that will happen hereafter is a dimension in the celestial there is a place where men are taught and weapons are given to them there is a school where they don't teach you how to talk about God why they are teaching you they are clothing you with the armor of battle that's why in songs of Solomon chapter 4 verse 4 he said it's like the ear of the mountain of David he said there are the armors of many warriors 
there is a place here where forms are kept and for you to bring witness in the order of Paul you have to journey to the mountain where Paul pulled off his armor that's where you'll be clothed but our generation don't have diligence in the spirit we don't have focus in the spirit we don't have tenacity in the spirit so men come for conferences like this they are impregnated with body and they are bought it with movies they are bought it with gossip they are bought it with friendship and things that deplete spiritual resources you will not have an you may not have an encounter that will make you a revivalist from here but you will receive a body that will energize you to journey to the mountain of your encounter when you leave this conference don't abort the things you hear these are not just messages these are alarms in zion that's why we preach the way we preach sometimes we literally have no courtesy the reason is because we are communicating the body into the heart of god how much bodies have you aborted that's the reason why you've not had the encounter that will make you relevant to your generation it's not about how many churches and how many ministries it's about the impact that you make in your generation where does your voice echo from and that's why i told you yesterday that most of you will go back to the mountain where god began with you because some of you god drew you to the mountain of intimacy some of you god drew you to the mountain of mysteries some of you god drew you to the mountain of fasting some of you god drew you to the mountain of the wall but you have left that mountain many years ago so you are no longer talking from that height that's why you can't change your world if 10 men in ghana have certain kinds of encounter you will discover that ghana is too small When you are preparing for encounters, there are many things you will avoid. When the angel came to Manoah's wife, he told her to avoid strong drink. For that woman, even if you were her best friend, she can't come for your birthday party. You may be offended with her, but she's trying to nurture something. There's an encounter that she's trying to nurture. When you see believers who live the life of freelance, it means they are not on their way to, it, to relevance. They don't know what it takes to change a generation. You are all over the place. You are busy here and there. You can't change your world. The time has come for us to embrace certain ways and part of it is the way of solitude. Some of us have too many friends. That's why we can't be relevant. Friends that we waste our life with waste our time with and we don't know the urgency in the spirit spiritual abortion is worse than natural abortion because when you lose a child in the natural you can have another one but sometimes when you lose a spiritual pregnancy you lose it forever God will look for another David. Encounters. They are the first requirements of revivalists. Moses had one. Gideon had one. John the Baptist had one. Paul had one. John had one. Everyone that changed their world, they had encounters. That encounter is what informed the kind of witness they bring to their generation else all of us will be copycats have you not seen people they tell you God spoke to them and everything they are doing is a replication of another ministry they don't have the ministry they are just looking for name and title in the spirit they are carrying out that other ministry they may give it another name on earth but where the ministry came from in heaven they know the badge Encounters. We must labor for encounters. Number two, in the making of revivalist is process. No revivalists appear from nowhere. 
All of us had caves where God trained us. You don't just show up. That's why I told you, this Christianity we are practicing now can raise men. This Christianity of 30 minutes in church, of pastor telling you everything you need, please sit down. This Christianity of coming to receive bread and wine, prophecies, you can't go anywhere with God. Many cannot endure the heat of process. God will take you through the fire, you will not be born. Then you will understand the language of fire. He said, John was in the wilderness in Luke 1 8 until the day of his showing forth. When you have bought process, you have bought your destiny. You can't appear without process and cause a change in your generation. Because if you only talk to people's heads, you can't talk to their heart. You don't know the way of the heart. Paul taught the doctrine of grace. Paul taught the doctrine of faith. But the point came, he said, we are the circumcision. That worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Having no confidence in the flesh. I had to go through process. My pride was chiseled. I am an intelligent man. I would have taught my generation by eloquence and lingo. But I would have ended up talking to their head. The power to speak to their heart is the fact that God took me to a place where I lost confidence in myself. So when I come to speak, I stream the frequencies of heaven. So I no longer know how to pick things because I'm smart. I know how to pick things because the Holy Ghost is moving. I've been in situations where there was no hope anywhere. So even in the dark, I can find the hand of God. That's what process does. The idea of process is to bring you to a place of trust. So that you lose trust in yourself and you trust in God. That's when you will know that eloquence is not an advantage in kingdom business unless God has lights upon it. That's when you know that height and stature is not an advantage unless God has lights upon it. That's when you will know that everything you have in the natural can become a disadvantage. The disadvantage many people have is their ability in the flesh. They are too intelligent for them to rely on the Holy Spirit. So every time the Holy Ghost wants to speak, they calculate it in their prayer. So for God to find such men, able to wield the powers of the ages to come, He will take them to a place where their intelligence will fail them many times. And these things are products of encounter. Because sometimes they will chisel you to a point where you will break. So a man's dealing cannot be your dealing. Your dealing is peculiar to the nature of the fall that you suffer. There are certain men that suffer the nature of the fall in the area of pride. So when God wants to bring them through the gate of process, He will allow them to be ridiculed. He will allow them to be accused. He will allow many things to happen to them that will chisel their pride. Somebody else may not have that kind of dealing because his problem is not pride. Maybe his problem is his eyes. He's humanizing. So God will take him to a season of drought to make sure that his eyes are washed with eyes out so that he can bring witness to a generation. The kind of process we undergo is a product of the fall that we suffer. And God will not reduce his hand until he's able to break you because he is the one that kill it and make it alive. If you don't know the path of death, you cannot know the journey into life. That's why Paul said we die daily. And it is in our dying that we provide life to the body of Christ. We have known the God that kill it and the God that make it alive. Process will destroy that which your confidence and coin so that you will come to a point where you don't trust yourself anymore. And when you get to that point, even if you are in the wilderness, when you cry, the whole of Jerusalem and Judea will come to you. You will not build church by church principles. You will build church because you have a voice for a generation. And when God brings you through process, you will not have regard for man. God will become your Lord. That's why the Pharisees came to John. Prominent men came to John. They thought he was like the political priest in the synagogue. He said, you good of vipers. What deceives you to think that you will escape the judgment of God? You don't talk to those men like that. Because those were the choice men of society. But revivalists, they don't look at men. They are looking unto him that is sitting on the throne, radiant in glory. And they said they look unto him and their faces were radiant and they were not ashamed. You don't need to bootleg in order to have money to sponsor your ministry. 
even in the wilderness they say your sons and your daughters will come from afar strangers will stand to build your walls you don't need to seek man's favor to be able to steal what the counsel of god because the one that put that voice in you he will cause the heart of men to be still to be stinged when you cry that's why the bible said even herod once in a while he goes to listen to john when he wants to hear the counsel of god even herod he couldn't get saved because the man talking is talking from the bowels of abba we are a generation that want to jump and appear because we think that everything is on the speed lane not the journey of revival in the journey of revival god will carry you through process because it is the finger of god that will teach you to fight to war Moses had burdens at 40. But God was watching him until he was 80 years old. The man had anger. And God wanted him to carry Israel from Egypt. And the people he wants to carry behave like animals. The kind of power God wants to give him, if God doesn't deal with that anger, he will be the one to kill Israel. So God allowed him to carry ships for 40 years. He didn't know the same patience that he applied in dealing with sheep is the same patience he will apply with Israel. The tides of process are treacherous. Sometimes you graduate, you say, I made first class. And then you come and say, everywhere they say, what is your name? You say, I'm first class. Oh, sorry, my name is Peter. Uh, it's first class. God will allow you, you will carry your certificate on your head for five years. If they like, they should pour a drum of oil on you. Nobody will pay attention to you. After five years, you will keep the certificate aside and say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me. That time, you are ready. You wake up, you say, you are beautiful. Nobody looks like you. God will allow you when you are 35. That's when he will start with you. You won't know how to trust yourself anymore. Even if you wanted to, you can't. That time you are ready. God can commit a generation to you. Because the power to rule a generation is an entrustment. It's not a gift. Do you know what it means for 10,000 people to follow one man? It's an entrustment. All of them have a definite destiny with God. For God to channel all their destiny to you is a humbling thing. But it has to be an entrustment. So God will chisel you. So that he can trust you with his heritage. You want to be a revivalist? You must embrace the, the bitterness of process. The pains of process. You must embrace the chastening of God. It's not a function of impartation. Impartation can give you a body or stay hunger in your spirit. Process can never be eluded. It can never. God wanted to use Paul, but Paul had to go to the wilderness of Arabia. Those were the years that Paul never had what chance to speak about. The things Paul said he saw that were unlawful. It was in his days in Arabia that God showed him those things. But those things are not for the public. They are the pathways that God took him. If Paul teaches it, you may think it's doctrine. So he decided to hide it. But those were the times God taught Paul how to become a humble man. Because Paul was, was mighty in word and he was an, an intelligent man. He excelled in knowledge. But he can't bring that to the corridors of the mortars. So God had to take him to a wilderness. And when he walked the path of solitude, a point came when he couldn't trust himself anymore. So even though he was an orator, when he wants to come out to preach the counsel of God, he will trust God for a word, for a word for his people. That was why his point came. Paul didn't say, I'm wise. He said, I am trustworthy. Concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. But as one who is trustworthy, this time around, God can trust me. So I can speak on behalf of God. I know the path where men follow and their ego is crushed. I know the path where men follow that their humanity is damaged because the things that end revival, they are always in the flesh. So God will chisel the flesh before he entrusts into you the powers of the ages to come. That's when you will know that you don't need to shout for Ghana to submit. There is a kind of power that if you have, when you stand and you speak, the nation will come to the feet of the cross. It's not in the volume. It's in the supply of the spirit. 
We don't know process. And that's why they are few revivalists among us. It's not how focused the message sounds. It is a witness of the spirit that is in the message. You can come to a place and say, God love you. And that God love you can change a thousand people. They will not be able to sleep. They will interact with the love of God from another pedestal. And suddenly, they will break down in God's presence. And you are wondering, what did you say? You didn't just say anything. You came with witness. But it's only in process that such powers are handed to men. The third thing that happens in an encounter is that God gives graces to men. The Bible said Moses, Acts 7.22, was mighty in words and in deeds. It's a power. He said Apollos was mighty in scriptures. It's a power. Paul said concerning himself in Ephesians 3 from verse 9, he said, I received grace to search into the exceeding mysteries of Christ and to preach it among the Gentiles. He said, and I received grace to make men see. It's an entrustment. There is a grace to make men see. There are many people that will talk, but nobody can understand them. The ability to open the ordinances of the Spirit is a grace to make men see. It is given when encounters are consummated through process. Peter was mighty in signs and wonders. John was mighty in the prophetic. They are entrustment. Till today, we are still trying to understand the prophecies of John. When he spoke about the seven churches, he was addressing churches at the same time he was addressing dispensations in the body of Christ. What level of depth is that? That a man is talking to the church in Ghana and at the same time he's talking about the dispensation of the body of Christ. That's not ordinary word of knowledge. That's a man that has seen the beginning and the end. He has turned it to the place where God stands that makes him omniscient. Because when Jesus appeared to him, he said, I am the beginning and the last. That's the word Alpha Omega. So where John entered in the spirit is a place called Alpha Omega. So John can tell you the beginning and the end. That's why it was John that said, in that which was in the beginning. Because he went to Alpha and it was John that told us at the end of time. He said, everything will end with Amen. Because the will of God will be done. Because John entered Alpha Omega. He entered where God stood that made God understand the beginning and the end. It's an entrustment. That is not just an everyday prophet. That is a man that has the pendulum of the spirit. And John can talk beginning and the end at the same time. There are places in the spirit. So when men speak, they speak on the strength of the grace that they have. They speak because of the encounters that they have. And they speak because of the process that they have journeyed to. And the body of Christ will not only have revivalists, but everyone among us will become that strong. So a day will come when one will prophesy, another will interpret. A day will come when the body of Christ will become an army, where no one will break their ranks. Every one of us will carry something and we will represent something in the spirit. This is why what God is doing is not just for a selected few. He say, ask of me rain in the time of the latter rain. And I will cause bright clouds. And I will cause the rain to fall on every blade of grass. So it doesn't matter if you are female or male. It doesn't matter if you are young or old. There is a rain that is coming that will fall on every blade of grass. And everyone that that rain falls upon will rise with powers that the world has not seen. That is when we will win scepters that will turn the armies of the alien backward. I stammer I know you are fearful you are not bold but wait for the rain wait for the rain when the rain comes they will discover that the orator is not better than you because the power you wield is not in the flesh it's a, it's a weapon it's a scepter in the spirit ah, 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 hey, hey, hey. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 33 is a time will fail me because there is a time that the body of Christ no longer has one champion many will have the same dimension that few have so it will become difficult 
to call Pastor Kusi because there will be a thousand and one Kusis. It will become difficult to call Bishop Aginasari because there will be a thousand and one of him. It will become difficult to call Dr. Dark Howard Mills. There will be a thousand and one of him. It will become difficult to call Duncan Williams. There will be a thousand and one of him because time will fail you. When you want to call one, there are a hundred people that operate in those dimensions. So which of them will you call? Which of them will you call? That's where the body of Christ is going. Where you no longer have superstars. But you will see widows that can call the dead back to life. So you won't need to go back to read the chronicles of the late Archbishop Benson Idahosa. Because the same thing Benson Idahosa did, a thousand widows can do it. Then you know that the outpouring has begun. A time will come. You will not seek apostles to come from afar. Because the testimony that the apostles bear on their lips, even the usher in church bear the same testimony. in Ghana and then you know that's a prophetic church where you will not call mighty apostles from Nigeria but when you say the church in Nigeria you know it's an apostolic church you will not call great evangelists from Kenya but when you say the church in Kenya you know it's an evangelical church because the powers of the ages to come will be resident in the body of Christ an army is rising and the move of the spirit is across continent from coast to coast, from west to east, from north to south, where a nation will become a part of the body of Christ. This is why God raises men. Men that will remind the body of Christ that the days of slumber, they are over. They are over. The days of Peri, they are over. The days of lukewarmness are over. An army is rising. And you are a part of that army. An army is rising. You are a part of that army. You are a part of that army. Thank God for Pastor E.A. Adeboye. Thank God for Dr. Aginasari. Thank God for Pastor Benny Hill. Thank God for Reverend Chris Oakilome. Thank God for Duncan Williams. Thank God for all the fathers. Thank God for the apostles. Apostle Arome Osai. Apostle Joshua Selma. Thank God for all of them. But an army is rising. An army is rising. An army is rising. Maravona Kayata. Beretonda Balia Totoni. Barakanda Sazava. We celebrate God for Sadhu Sunda Savaraj. We celebrate God for the mighty warriors in the body of Christ. We thank God for Dr. Pastor Paul and Nancy. We thank God for all of them. John Hagee, we thank God for them. But an army is rising. An army is rising. An army is rising. I'm happy I've met great men of God. But I'm ready to meet the church of power, the church of signs, the church of wonders. We are faceless, faceless, weak men. We rot dimensions of glory that we can only imagine this is why we come before the Lord and we tell him we are ready are you 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 ready you want to pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute Everyone who is ready tonight, 
there is one confession you have to make lord i present myself as the sacrifice use me for your glory use me for your glory Tell the Lord, use me for your glory. Don't hide under the prayer. I have more than the song. Today, I brought myself. I am your sacrifice. I have more than a song. Today, I brought myself. I am your worship. I have more than a song. Today, I brought myself. I am your sacrifice. I have more than a song. generation or do we expect another generation we surrender we surrender we surrender we surrender I have more than a song today I brought myself I am your sacrifice. I have more than a song. Today, I brought myself. I am your worship. Brother, we lift up holy hands tonight. And we ask you to look upon us. We surrender to you. Not just the things we have, 
but our very own lives. You know, at salvation, two transactions took place. When you confess the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you receive the life of God. But when you confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you gave him your own life. And today, we submit to that transaction. We don't only receive the life of God, but we give ours in exchange. And we say, Lord, use us for your glory. You are surrendering to the Lord tonight. You lift your hands toward heaven. And let him see it. wants to do with you let him do it because you have surrendered this night so some of you they will carry you tomorrow they will carry you from this hall they will carry you home you won't know yourself and even at that we won't stop we the holy ghost are